Welcome to Monday morning. This is a grief, um, the grief and mourning video live to um, help bring knowledge and information and space for people who are experiencing loss due to the passing of a loved one. Today is the second of three talking about this book, The Paradoxes of Mourning. Let's see if I can change that lighting a little bit. It is by Dr. Alan Wolfelt. And today we're talking about chapter two. So chapter two is talking about um, making friends with the darkness before you enter the light. It sounds very confusing. Most people just want to ignore the darkness that comes with grief and loss. And uh, Dr. Alan Wolfeld is saying that we have to make friends with it. It's just part of our journey. And if we ignore the darkness, it will it can make you sick. Um, in the past, humans really embrace the darkness. In, um, in our Western cultures, we would wear black for at least a year. And um, in some Asian cultures, they would wear red. And I believe in India, they would wear white. So in lots of cultures, even dressing would show that we were in that period of darkness, that morning. And the lovely thing about that would be that people would treat you kinder and understand that you may not be reacting to things the same way and that you might be moving slower through the world. And they would give opportunities to share and talk about what was going on in your world. One of the things that Dr. Alan Wolfelt then talks about is the dark night of the soul. And so again, that's the old customs. That's the time where you go inside and you really, really look at who you are now with, with this new loss, what, you, what your world is going to look like, how things have changed. It's very, it's very internal. Lots of times we have what we think are dark emotions and when we talk about dark emotions, we're talking about things like sadness and pain. And they aren't bad emotions. They are important. They teach us something. So he talks about befriending that pain, welcoming those dark emotions, sitting with them as we learn who we are and as we change in this world. Should we deny that pain? Absolutely not. It is something that we need to experience. However, to experience the full onslaught of all of that grief and that pain would be inhumane, it would kill us. So we dose it. We should dose the pain. When it comes, you can feel it but don't expect to feel it or want to feel it all at once. A lot of times I hear people say, I just want to do this and get it over with. I just want to move on. And we don't change that way. We don't learn that way. That much pain would literally kill us. So during this time, nurture yourself. Nurture yourself physically. So try to get rest. Try to move your body. Try to eat well, carry around a water bottle, get enough water, take care of yourself emotionally. You can write, you can talk to people. Later on in this chapter, we'll talk about what kind of people are good to talk to. Really take care of yourself and be gentle and kind to yourself. We need to move into that darkness. You can't celebrate yourself out of it. You need to feel it. 
So Miriam Greenspan wrote a book called Healing Through Dark Emotions, which I am now going to get, and I'm sure I will end up talking about on this Monday morning videos. She has a three-step process for this. It's attending, befriending, and surrendering. So when you're attending the pain and those dark emotions and those dark feelings, you're acknowledging them and you're naming them. Call them by what they are. I'm feeling sad. I feel pain. I feel lonely. I feel loss. All of the things. Just naming them brings them up inside myself when I'm talking about it. Everyone wants to be named and our feelings, when they're named and felt and acknowledged, it gives them a chance to move. And so then what I just did there was I was mindfully aware of what, what rose in me, what naming those actually felt like. Try it. Try acknowledging it. Try naming it. And then be mindful of what happens and let it flow through. Don't hold on to it. Just let it flow. And the last one is surrendering. So that's the letting it flow through. So you're acknowledging it, naming it, being aware of the feelings, and then let them go. It's very gentle. Something that has been one of my favorite quotes that I've heard from Dr. Alan Wolfeld, and even in his book, he wasn't sure where this came from. But the quote is, darkness is the chair upon which light sits. And there's so much in that you think of the sun sitting in the darkness of the universe and even the moon when the light is shining off of it it's just there a small bright light in a big vast sea of darkness and so for us we need to really acknowledge the darkness and be there so that the light can come sit upon it once sometime. The next part he talks about is clean pain versus dirty pain. <clears throat> so clean pain is the pain we feel when a significant loss happens. I don't have to tell you how that feels. Everyone knows how that pain is. And that pain is important to feel and you can attend it and you can acknowledge it and befriend it and surrender it. When it turns dirty into dirty pain, that's that damaging pain is when we catastrophize what happened and make it a, even worse than it already is. We don't need to make it worse than it already is. When we judge ourselves, oh, if I had done this, or if I had done that right, or I can't believe I said that, and I shouldn't have gotten mad at that person that one time, and I wish I had, that's dirty pain. Also, when other we feel like other people are judging us, that can be dirty pain. We don't know for sure how other people are actually reacting. And we can only guess that. So, when you're catching yourself doing these things, it's great to like take a step back and say, okay, is this clean pain or dirty pain? And if you have somebody that you trust and can explain clean pain and dirty pain to, or show this video to, perhaps you'll have somebody to help you when you are going down that road of clean pain versus dirty pain. You can even do a list on the side of what good pain and a clean pain feels like and what dirty pain feels like. If you're telling yourself a story that's making it far worse, that is not clean pain. Clean pain is 
just the pain. So why is grief necessary? That is a huge question. I was, I was happy to see that Dr. Alan Wolfelt talks about why it's necessary. And grief forces us to regroup. It forces us to regroup physically, cognitively, emotionally, socially, and spiritually. We feel grief because somebody who died, our loved one, was a huge part of our world. And when you take that part out, everything gets rearranged. And we're not even sure how it all fits together anymore. And so grief makes us slow down. It makes us reassess. Everything changes. If you had, if your loved one lived in your home with you, you're gonna shop differently. You're gonna go into the fruit section and you're gonna look at those grapes and go, I don't even really like grapes. I bought them for my loved one. You, all kinds of things change. You may decide not to go camping anymore. You didn't really love camping, but you loved your partner. So you went camping with them and you made the best out of it. But what's next? Your spiritual beliefs may have been tied together and maybe they're a little bit different now. The things change and grief helps us slow down. There's something called anhedonia, which is the inability to feel pleasure in activities we used to enjoy. Some people call it the lethargy of grief. If you have ever grieved or mourned, you will understand that this slowing down and this lack of pleasure and things stops. Lots of people stop their hobbies. They want to change their jobs. They just might not enjoy the snacks they used to have. Like, they might not like the shows they used to love. So many things happen during this time. And when you're feeling this, do your best to ignore our societal messages of carry on, keep busy. I have somebody that you should meet. All of those things are not what you need right now. You need to listen to your body and be still with it. He goes into talking about soul work and spirit work. And soul work is that deep down emotional work that we do that is about us and who we are. Spirit work, on the other hand, is up and light. And it's, it's, it's figuring out who you are. It's renewal. And you cannot do spirit work until you do the soul work. The soul work is the foundation. It's the foundation of everything that guides your life. And your foundation has been rocked. Seriously. So you cannot expect to do that spirit work until you've done the soul work. Again, with the darkness of grief, acknowledge, befriend, and express. That's a little bit different than attending, befriending, and surrendering, but it's pretty close. Acknowledge it, befriend it, and express it. Sometimes I talk to people and I suggest, invite it for tea. Oh, there you are, sadness. Let me make a cup of tea and we'll sit together for a while. Just be with it. Befriend it and express it. Another thing that he talks about in this chapter is insomnia. So if you're experiencing chronic ongoing insomnia, he suggests going to see a doctor about that. It's very hard to think clearly and live your life and do things when you are not getting any sleep or rest. It is fairly impossible to heal in that aspect. It will make you ill. On the other hand, 
insomnia can create times of reflection. You can, you're laying in your bed and you can't sleep, get up, put your feet on the floor. If you can, go to a window and look outside. If it's even nice out, you can go outside and feel the air and the peace and let the darkness surround you. During this time when everything around is still, this is a time to journal. Write letters, whether you send them or not. Write letters to yourself, to other loved ones, to your loved one that has passed on. Take some time to write. I live in a fairly safe neighborhood and sometimes when I have had those experiences, I just go for a walk around the block. In the darkness, everything is different. You see shadows differently. You see little blips of light in places that you wouldn't expect. Everything is heightened, all of your other senses. It's kind of like that in grief. Everything's different. The shadows are different. The world isn't as big, it's much smaller. The next thing that he talks about is wallowing. And in our society, <laughs> people, I already talked about the messages a little bit of carry on, keep busy, keep doing the things. You should go do this. You should do that. He suggests wallowing in your grief, which is attending, befriending, and expressing. Just be in it. He likened it to um, some animals wallowing in the dirt and it helps cleanse them. And our cat, she does that every spring. She goes out and she just rolls around in the dirt and she'll come in and she's just this dusty thing. And so I looked it up because I'm like, why would a cat do that? They seem quite clean. And I learned that there's microbes in the dirt that help keep them healthy. And so after a winter of not being able to wallow in the dirt, they go out and they get really dirty and it helps the microbiome of their skin and inside their bodies be healthy. And so he likens it to that. Wallowing in your feelings is healthy. It's acknowledging them. It's being there. It's very important. And it's very important not to avoid it. When does it get complicated? Well, it gets complicated if it's chronic. So the symptoms of the grief do not change or soften over time. So even though I've heard and that it really intense grief can be, recent grief can be two years or longer, there should still be a gradual softening or changing over time. If it's been 10 years, it's probably a good idea to talk to somebody. Call a counselor. Again, FCSS has a lot of counselors. We can talk to you about your grief. I remember down the street from a friend's house, there was an older gentleman whose wife had passed away 10 years prior and everything in his house was exactly the same. Never changed, never moved, never adapted to his new world. And I felt sad for him because I could see that he was very, very lonely. So I very, very much hope that if you're one of those people who are not feeling a softness or a changing of your feelings, please, please, please get some help. It's very important for you. So we're going to talk a little bit about light. So there is some light in the darkness. Uh, Dr. Alan Wolfelt talks about the yin-yang. So you know it's white and black 
and then in the white there's some black and in the black there's a little dot of white just showing that there are two sides of a whole we need both of them and nothing is ever fully light or fully dark there's always a blend so some of the lights in the darkness are empathy so I've spoken a few times about talking to people about your grief and and explaining what's happened and telling your story and the people that you want to talk to are going to be empathetic that is a very big difference from sympathy sympathy has like a shield around you around them and they're kind of above you and they feel sorry for you and um they just don't get down into that level with you of feeling where you're at empathy is where you're talking to somebody who's feeling similar to what you are they're understanding you on that base level they don't have that guard up they're with you and they're compassionate and they're curious about what's going on that's what empathy is and that brings some light having that connection can bring light Another one is light of levity and humor. It's okay to laugh. Human beings have been laughing at the darkness for an eternity, as long as there was language. I'm suspecting even before there was language. We know how to laugh. And it's really, really appropriate to laugh. Please do so. Some people like to watch shows, um, some people like to watch videos. Sometimes just when you're talking with somebody who's empathetic, you're going to find some laughter. And the laughter isn't always appropriate. They call it dark humor. There's lots of different things that people call it. Lots of people in the helping professions have a humor that other people on the outside would not understand. And then people that are grieving quite possibly would have humor that a lot of people on the outside wouldn't understand. And the final note is the light is not a destination. It's an addition. It's part of the journey. When you're in the darkness, just like the night sky, there's usually little stars shining some nights the moon is super bright and it's almost like day and then in the daytime it's not always bright and sunny the clouds go over the sky, sun the rain will fall and then it'll pass and that is much like the grief experience and so i really enjoyed this second paradox of grief you must make friends with the darkness before you enter the light because it's very true. The darkness is here for a reason. It's a time of rest and renewal. And it can be lonely. But there are points of light. So please, please experience your darkness. Please take care of yourself. And remember that you are important. And this journey is important. Thank you for listening. Monday morning with Tani. And I will see you next Monday with the final chapter of The Paradoxes of Grief by Dr. Alan Wolfelt. Take care.